to the young people. He could talk to the old people. He could talk to the robbers. He could talk to the thief. He could even have a conversation with the man who traded him for 30, 30 coins of silver. He will have a conversation with tax collectors. He had conversations with sinners. He's always ready to meet you where you're at. Jesus had that conversation with the adulterous women. When women commit adultery, men commit adultery, we throw them away. We kick them to the curb. We talk about them on Facebook. We put their business on blast. Jesus goes and has a conversation with that person. Jesus is unafraid of having these conversations. He'll go right to your workplace and have that conversation. The same way he went to the lame man, the same way he went to James, the same way he went to John, the same way he went to Peter, same way he went to Matthew. He will meet you where you are at just to have that uncomfortable conversation. Are you ready? If you will go with me this morning and open up your Bibles to the book of Galatians, and we're going to go right to chapter one of Galatians, and we're going to read from the first to the 13th verse. And from this reading, we will give birth to the message on today. Galatians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you in peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from his present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that call you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any gospel unto you that then that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men? Listen closely. It's a question. For do I now persuade pers Persuade men or God? Who are you trying to persuade, men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversations in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. I, throughout my entire life, sometimes it has been very difficult for me 
to have certain conversations. I struggle with the interpersonal skills at times. I struggle with the words at times. I struggle with the emotions that run through my body at times when it's time for embracing an uncomfortable conversation. Now I read the scripture to you and it should hit home because in our lives, we all will have an opportunity to have and to embrace a uncomfortable conversation. But when we embrace it, we must think about the grace and we must think about the truth that must go in to a difficult, uncomfortable conversation. We as believers, we should feel uncomfortable in this life. We as believers should look upon the Bible to convince us and help us change our ways. The Bible should teach us to live more like Christ. Remember, Jesus was unafraid about having any uncomfortable conversation with anybody during that time. Jesus is willing to talk to anyone. This is a fact. He did not shy away from any uncomfortable conversations. So don't be afraid on today. Don't be afraid to have a conversation that can change the trajectory of a person's life. Our life, our loved ones, our friends are so desperately in need of an uncomfortable conversation. Whether that conversation is about the church of God and saints of Christ, and we all should agree that we should sit down and have a conversation about our church. Whether that conversation is about what's going on in your home life right now, you should agree as a family to sit down and have an uncomfortable conversation. Whether or not it's your job, and this sermon was giving birth because of uncomfortable conversations that your deacon had to have in order to get his school in order? Are you willing to have this uncomfortable conversation? It might be with your extended family. It might be with your next door neighbor. And my wife can attest to this. We just had a difficult uncomfortable conversation many, many months ago when it comes to my neighbor of 20 some odd years. Because you never know what God would put in a person's life and how they will react to it. So uncomfortable conversations happen all the time. Select the particular problem in your life right now. A problem that has been long standing. It could be a family feud. It could be a sense of hopelessness about a particular individual. Before you ever say a word, you need to sincerely invite God in the midst of that conflict to mediate that conflict, to mediate your emotions, to make it possible to have that uncomfortable conversation. Make it a deep, deliberate, prayer, not just a last minute request, not just a drive by, but be intentional and be deliberate about your uncomfortable conversation. We need Christ to work on our behalf. We need Christ to be in the mix. We need Christ to guide us through any and every uncomfortable conversation. You may be the person who needs an intervention. You have to be willing and open for that uncomfortable conversation. 
you may be the person who's been selected to have that conversation on another person's behalf, but you have to be willing to be patient to see a breakthrough by having these uncomfortable conversations. So let's talk about how an uncomfortable conversation should go. My first rule is rule number one. Don't make the conversation about yourself. I'm going to repeat that again. Far too often we go into a situation and it's all about me. Me, 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 me. I, 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 I. Do not make the conversation about yourself. No matter if you're going or giving up or you feel uncomfortable, you do not make the conversation about yourself. The truth will set you free. I am a witness. All uncomfortable conversations have to be grounded in the truth of God and the word of God. In the book of Galatians, it says, Galatians 1.10, it clearly talks about we should not be trying to win the approval of the people that we're trying to have an uncomfortable conversation for. We are not pleasing people. We are servants of Christ. It says, for do I, for do I now persuade men of God, or do I seek to please men? You have to decide what the goal is. Are you trying to please God, or are you trying to please men through your conversation? He went on to say, but I certify you, brother, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after men. So if you're having these conversations, you have to be a recipient of the revelations of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus was not afraid to have conversations. Our scripture in our Bible challenges us to think about these conversations. It's not your feelings that are important, but as believers, we should not allow the fear of other people's message to stop us from having this conversation. No matter how uncomfortable it might be, we are servants of Christ. So whatever or whenever the opportunity arises, you have to come out with the voice of change. You have to provide healing and understanding to that conversation. We should never let the opinions of others affect us. Number two, remember the end in mind. I got, I, 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 I read Stephen Covey a lot. Seven highly, seven habits of highly effective people. One of his biggest habits is remember the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. What is your desired outcome as a result of this conversation. Remember your end goal. In 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 3, 7 and 8. So then neither is he that planteth anything. I love this one. Neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one and every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor. So what does this mean? It means it's not important who does the planting. It's not important who does the watering. The message is clear. What's important is that God allows his seeds to grow. That's the message. The one who plants and the one who waters should ultimately work together with the same purpose in mind. And guess what? Both, not one, but both will be rewarded based on their work. The scripture talks about planting and watering as if we are helping God plant and grow his plants. For it's not our job to change anyone, but it's our job to help 
bring change to people by being rewarded through uncomfortable conversations that are driven by God. In the same way, let us choose to view our wisdom and understanding as an important tool as we give advice, as we give warnings. Let us help these people plant their seeds. In the Bible, Jesus had many uncomfortable conversations, but the end goal was mine to be a mind like Christ. Sometimes that one uncomfortable conversation that you are holding back from, from that one person could be the change that that person needs, that seed that they need to be planted so that they may surrender to God and change their ways. Are you willing to have this uncomfortable conversation? Remember, if you do, you have to remember to love. You have to remember to have patience. You have to remember to grant understanding. Remember the grace and the truth that is needed in that difficult conversation. Just know in life, if you are a believer of Christ, your life will be uncomfortable. If you read the Bible and go out in the world, your life will be uncomfortable. If you follow the 10 commandments and go into society, you will have a uncomfortable life. If you are a believer of the seven keys, if you are a believer of the stone of truth, you should convince yourself that change is needed. Remember to love. Are you remembering to come from a place of love from your conversation? In Ephesians 4.29, it states, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, and this is where I had a problem with uncomfortable conversations, let all bitterness, let all wrath, let all anger, let all clamor, let all evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another. How many people practice kindness on a regular basis? Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, have forgotten or forgiven you. Don't use foul language when you're having these uncomfortable conversations. Let everything you say be grounded in the word of God so that your words will be an encouragement to those that are listening. Are you ready to have this uncomfortable conversation? The scripture talks about how we should have this conversation. It talks about how we need to build these bridges. It talks about how we need to be believers of what we talk about. We are not to tear each other down. We are not to rip each other apart. We are to come from a place of love when we are having these uncomfortable conversations. A lot of times, conflict arises in our life. Past experience kind of sets the tone, but our mouths should be vessels for Christ. So we need to be intentional what comes out of our mouth using loving and kind words, not condemning words that are harmful and hurtful to people. We don't have to make people feel uncomfortable with our, way, with our words because the conversation itself will lend itself for students or people to be uncomfortable. So let's think about it for a second. Our temperament must be correct. We cannot be a hypocrite when we having these conversations. What I think about now is when I'm having a conversation with, these, with our young children today, whether it's our own children, whether it's children in our community, whether it's our nieces and our nephews, we learn to, we must learn to have that uncomfortable conversation that's built in love. They might be experiencing drug use. 
We have to have an uncomfortable conversation with them. They might be experiencing promiscuity. We must have an uncomfortable conversation about that. They might be living a life of depression, bipolar, manic behavior. We must have a conversation about. They might be suffering from mental illness. They might be on the verge of dropping out of high school or dropping out of college. We must come with loving and kind words of understanding and prayer and not be hypocritical in that situation. Are you ready to have an uncomfortable conversation? It says, do not be anxious for anything, but in everything with prayer and supplication, you need to petition and give thanksgiving and be present and have your request made from God. Are you ready for this, uh, this uncomfortable conversation? Even people with faith tend to run ahead of God, to get ahead of God to think they have all the answers. A lot of times, tell me if this is you, a lot of times we come to that conversation already as the judge, the jury, and the executioner. Our logic is either skewed to the right or skewed to the left. Our reasoning has already convicted the people that we're trying to save. But the common thread, which I said earlier, it's not about me, it's not about you, it's not about I, it's about us. How do we grow together as a family? How do we grow together as a church? How do we grow together as a husband and wife? How do we grow together as brothers and sisters? How do we grow together as a work family? What do we need to do to address the things that are preventing us from being successful? Are you ready to have that conversation? The purpose of a person's heart are like deep waters. I love this one. From Proverbs 20 and 5, it tells you, counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but man of understanding will draw it out. Have you ever tried to draw feelings and emotions out of a person's heart that doesn't want to communicate at all? That is one of the hardest things to do in life. You ever had a conversation with somebody who refuses to even say a word to you? You need to deep, dig deep down and understand the purposes and the intentions and the depth of the waters flowing through that man or that woman's heart. A wise person once told me this story. It was a man and a woman one day. They were arguing. They were arguing over an orange. Eventually, the argument was so bad that they had to be separated. And they were sent to different rooms to calm down. While in the room, the man ate half of his orange and threw the pills away. Because during this argument, they decided, you know what? We're just gonna split the orange down the middle. So the man, he ate half the orange and he threw the pill away. The woman, on the other hand, she peeled the pill off the orange and she threw the orange away. And here's my question, if only, or here's my statement, if only they would have given each other a fair chance to communicate with one another about this orange, the man would have been able to eat the entire orange and the woman would have been able to use all of the pills to cook her meal with the oranges. Sometimes we don't understand the mission. Sometimes we don't understand the end result. It's precarious to assume a person's motivation. We didn't know why they were fighting over that orange. One wanted to eat it, one wanted to use it for cooking. But if we put our differences aside and just learn how to communicate, we would not be where we are at today. 
to describe why people do this rather than assume people's motivation, rather than guess what's going on, you sit down and have that conversation and outline your goal and your purpose, and then you can get everything that you want. When we have that conversation, you have to deal with the problem. Woo! You have to deal with the problem. Far too often we let problems settle in our heart. We let problems settle in our mind. We can't sleep at night. We're restless. Oh, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna save this situation? What do I need to do? The scripture says, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. In Ephesians 4, 26, be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down on your wrath. When we have these long standing battles, it gets internally in our souls and it paralyzes us to the point of we can't do anything until we deal with that conflict. We have to be long standing. We have to get the advice that comes from the apostle Paul himself, who is no stranger to conflict. Paul counsel comes from a man who has been there, but most of us has been there too. We sidestep, we sidestep, we sidestep difficult, necessary conversations just to have peace. We tiptoe around problems that exist, but we're scared to deal with them. Why are we scared to have these uncomfortable conversations. If your brother or your sister sins, go and point out their faults just between you and them. In Matthew 18, 15, moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his faults between them, thee and him alone. Far too often, we try to make a spectacle of somebody. We try to embarrass people. We get on the pulpit and we try to use the pulpit as a bully pit. We want to bully people and shame people and silence people and embarrass people instead of taking them somewhere and having a private, difficult, uncomfortable conversation with them. It's not your job to put them, their business on blast. It's not your job to, to block somebody from coming into the tabernacle. It's not your job to tell somebody they don't have the right to the tree of life. It's your job to save souls, ministers. It's your job, saints, to save souls and bring souls back to Christ. It's not your job to condemn. It's not your job to hate. It's not your job to make people feel less than what they already are feeling. It's your job to love on them and bring them and make them whole. Are you having that uncomfortable conversation? It's very tempting to publicly embarrass somebody. It's very tempting to go on Facebook and put a post about something or something or somebody who upset you in your family. It's very easy to be at the workplace and we do a reply to all, all 300 members on this email chain to tell them how you really feel. You understand? But it's better to pull them to the side and grow with them, to pray with them, to help them, to talk with them, to pray for them, to pray on them and pray for them in particular, as well as praying for yourself. We don't need a public outcry. We don't need a peanut gallery. We don't need a shaming incident. We want to get closer to God. So find that private place just between you and them and work it out. You need to listen. Woo, this is a hard one right here because I'm hard headed. I talk over people. People telling me about myself, I don't want to hear what they talking about. So I'm going to talk right over them. And no, no, no. And you talk and you talk a little louder. I'm going to talk right over you. I'm terrible at that. 
I'm terrible at that. When you want to try to tell me about myself, when you want to try to tell me where I need to fix myself, when you want to tell me I'm not doing godly works, I am poor at listening. You need listening skills. You need listening skills. Listen before you answer. I'm going to tell you why, why it's important to listen. It says, God said, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And James, it says, wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. How many of us do the opposite? We don't listen, we're fast to speak, and then we give them the wrath, the wrath of God. We come down there, boom, you're done, boom, you're fired, boom, boom, boom. We want to be a listening saints. We want to be a listening church. We want to listen closely and learn a new perspective about something you had a different opinion about. You have to humbly submit yourself as a tactic. You have to sometimes, I sit there and I bite my tongue. Kenya, listen. Deacon, listen. Deacon, there's a message for you. You have to listen. Stop having a big, thick skull. Listen, Deacon, that trying God is trying to tell you something by going through somebody else only if you will listen. Rather than be disagreeable, show some inward humility. And what typically follows, guess what? When you listen to others, guess what they'll do? They will, in turn, listen to you. Listening is important. And while you're listening in this uncomfortable conversation, learn to tame your tongue. Our tongue is wicked. Our tongue, the words are reckless. It pierces like a sword. The tongue of the wise will bring healing. Proverbs 12, 18. There is that speaketh like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. You got to be wise and healthy. Talk less, listen more. Do you remember anybody who ever said some hurtful words to you? Do you remember how those words stick to you? They don't leave right away. Has somebody assaulted you with their tongue and you have never forgiven? They gave some cutting words to you. You never were able to heal from that. As the proverb says, your little tongue, that little old tongue in your mouth has a lot of power. Be careful how you use it. Fools show their arrogance. Fools show their annoyance. But the, but the prudent, they overlook all insults. Fools' wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covers shame. You know it's going to happen. It happens on a regular, so get ready and adjust yourself to have this uncomfortable conversation. Everyone should look out for God's word. Everyone should be on the lookout, not for their own interests, but for God's words. In Philippians 2, 4, it says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. The hallmark of a Christian is caring, is love, is hope, is love, is patience. You have to be able to exhibit that as a Christian. Refresh yourself and remember Jesus is talking to you. Remind yourself and never forget Jesus was the one who wiped your slate clean. So if you're having an uncomfortable conversation and that person's slate needs to be clean, guess what? Jesus did it for you. You should be willing to do it for others. Are you ready for this uncomfortable conversation? Based on the reality of hell, and I'm going to say this again, based on the reality of hell, the doctrine of hell makes us very uncomfortable. 
Raise your hand if you're uncomfortable with the doctrine of hell. All right? Why? Because hell shapes our belief. It's very uncomfortable to talk about hell. It shapes our belief. It shapes our belief. If you do not accept the reality of hell, you cannot enjoy the gospel of Christ. Yeah, I said it. If you cannot wrap your mind around the fact that there is a hell, how can you accept the doctrine of Christ? That's an uncomfortable conversation. God's word is precious. Jesus doesn't only refer to hell. Jesus had the most uncomfortable conversations to known to man in the Bible. Jesus talked about it. He referenced hell. He said it would be an unquenchable fire. He talked about hell. It would be a place where you anguish that you regret to be at. He talked about hell as being an outer darkness. He compared it to, 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 to just being surrounded by trash, by rubbish, by maggots. That's what hell is. Jesus talks about hell more than he talks about heaven. There's no denying that Jesus knew and believed that we needed to have an uncomfortable conversation to get the absolute reality of hell. The reality of hell. Jesus wasn't afraid to talk about it. Jesus talked about anything and everything to everybody. Because of the sins of Adam and Eve, we are all guilty. We are all corrupt. We are all in line for eternal punishment. But contrary to popular belief, hell is not a place that God is going to send you. Wake up call. God doesn't send you directly to hell. We are condemned. Jesus is our fixer. Remember, Jesus will pave the way if we will only allow him to come into our lives. Jesus had these conversations. He met with people. He discussed uncomfortable things with the Samaritan woman. He talked about that. Him being a Jew with a Samaritan, drinking from the well, with the crippled beggar. He wasn't afraid to go around handicapped people. I work with handy, I walk work, I work with autistic children. Sometimes we are afraid. We're afraid to go around students with, with, with handicaps, students with disabilities. Sometimes as adults, we don't know how to interact that students or young children that have been born in this world afflicted. But Jesus had the questions. Jesus had the answers. Jesus had the conversation. Jesus could talk to the young people. He could talk to the old people. He could talk to the robbers. He could talk to the thief. He could even have a conversation with the man who traded him for 30, 30 coins of silver. He will have a conversation with tax collectors. He had conversations with sinners. He's always ready to meet you where you're at. Jesus had that conversation with the adulterous women. When women commit adultery, men commit adultery, we throw them away. We kick them to the curb. We talk about them on Facebook. We put their business on blast. Jesus goes and has a conversation with that person. Jesus is unafraid of having these conversations. He'll go right to your workplace and have that conversation. The same way he went to the lame man, the same way he went to James, the same way he went to John, the same way he went to Peter, same way he went to Matthew. He will meet you where you are at just to have that uncomfortable conversation. Are you ready? Are you ready for this uncomfortable conversation? Few, few people are. You have to be special. You have to be unnerved. You have to be willing to have these conversations. Jesus asked questions in half of his conversations, and he responded to questions in the other ones. He was not afraid. Jesus knew how to take the initiative. Jesus knew how to meet you where you are at. Jesus knows how to come on your own turf to have this conversation. Jesus is interesting because he's ready to show that he has common ground in common interest to meet you where you are, to bring you where you need to be. Are you ready to have this uncomfortable conversation? And they, and they said, one another, did not our heart burn within us when Jesus talked to us, while he talked to us by the way, and while he opened to the scriptures. These are his followers talking. Let no unwholesome world Word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word 
that is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to the hearer. In St. Matthew 12, 35, it says, the good man brings out his good treasures, what is good. And the evil man brings out his evil tre treasures, what is evil. In Colossians 4, 6, it says, let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each other. But let your statements, let your statements be yay, yay, or nay, nay. Anything beyond that would be considered evil. As I get ready to wrap this up, this is all about having a difficult conversation. I love speaking to my brothers and sisters from South Africa at this time, and all of my brothers and sisters from everywhere that's on this Zoom line. I'm hoping from this conversation, you remember the three most important pieces of this message. One, it's not about you. Remember that. Two, Remember the end in mind when you're having these conversations. Remember what your goal is. And also remember, remember to love. Remember to love. Without love in the equation, Y equals MX plus B, without love being in that equation, it will not work. Difficult conversations are characterized by your emotions. Keep your emotions in check. Keep your fear in check. Keep your anger in check. Keep your frustration in check. Understand the conflict. Understand what we need to do to solve it. Don't let these emotions stay pent up in you. These are words of wisdom. Strong emotions will divide a church. Strong emotions will divide a family. Pent up emotions running high will destroy God's work. Remember to have these private conversations. Also, you remember you must be a good listener. You must be a good listener in order for you to make a difference. If you are not a good listener, then there is no difference to be made. Lastly, some of these conversations are gonna involve a disagreement. Understand it's just a di disagreement. Don't take it personal. Don't get your feelings caught up. Don't, under, don't try to understand things that are not understandable. Also, when you're dealing with your feelings, put your feelings to the side. Put your feelings to the side to have this conversation. And then your identity, you must identify. You must identify this impact. How is it going to impact my family? How is it going to impact my job? Most importantly, how is it going to impact my church and my walk and my salvation with the Lord? Am I bringing lives closer to Jesus as a result of this conversation? Don't let your emotions derail the conversation. Don't get off centered. Don't feel anxious. And whatever you do, do not risk your relationship with God by having an uncomfortable conversation that doesn't end well. Remember in Matthew 540, they talked about giving someone your coat after giving someone your coat after they take your shirt. That's what uncomfortable conversations leads to. You can talk with people who wronged you and still get results. You have to be willing to feed your enemy. If he hungry, give him food. If he's thirsty, give him water. You have to be able to also repay evil with good. But the most important thing that we all must live and try is to forgive. We have to practice forgiveness. And if nothing most, if you take this conversation and you sit down with your enemies, you sit down with the people who have wronged you, you sit down to the people who may have abused you, that may have talked down about you, that may have slandered your name from the East Coast to the West Coast, 
You have to learn how to forgive. And the only way you're going to forgive is through prayer. So as I sit down, remember, Jesus had these uncomfortable conversations for us so that we can go out and have these conversations with others to bring them closer to Christ. May God bless you. May God keep you. This was not only an honor, but a privilege to stand before you to have this uncomfortable conversation. We have to move our church. We have to move our leaders. We have to light fire under the flock. We need sheeps that are working. In order for us to do this, we must not be afraid. You can't be afraid of the bishop. You can't be afraid of the evangelist. You cannot be afraid of the chairman of the board. You cannot be afraid of the ghosts that are haunting your soul. You have to be willing. You have to be able to have this uncomfortable conversation so that we can save lives, so that the banner of the church of God and saints of Christ everywhere will never, ever trail the ground. Do you love your church? If you love your church, you'll have a conversation. Do you love your wife? If you love your wife, you'll have a conversation. Do you love your children? If you love your children, you will have the conversation. But more importantly, do you love God? If you love God, sit down, plan out that conversation and have it because you don't know who will benefit from those words. God bless you and God keep you is my prayer.